Hello, and welcome for my presentation for today on multilingualism. It's a complicated topic with lots of contradicting information, but I tried to, as much as I can, make it simpler for you and me. So, they will be um, dealing with what, what is multilingual. Um, what is what it is like what are the kinds some kinds who can be considered hopefully we can answer that one and how does it work in terms of its linguistic properties and also let's have a preview on what goes in our brain um, we also have an interesting case study that I'll be discussing so please hang in there and let's get started so we have here multilingualism and broadly defined multilingualism at least as it is agreed upon by most writers and linguists is the ability to function in more than one language in spoken or and printed forms so if we ask if you can count say one two three if you can count to ten in german or in korean and spanish are you multilingual no because you cannot function you cannot hold a conversation you cannot go to the supermarket and buy something so that doesn't count now other one what if i can read and write in another language or other languages but I'm not fluent at speaking. Am I considered multilingual? For some sources, yes. For to some degree of functionality, you are considered a multilingual. Now, an interesting fact, uh, fact or a question though: Would you? Are we Filipinos, or majority of us, are we multilingual or bilingual? Considering we speak the Filipino language and English on top of our dialect as we call it so to answer the question if we are multilingual or bilinguals let's take a look at how pidea.com gives us the definition so by definition dialect is a particular form of language which is peculiar to a specific region or social group so check Right? Ilocano, Ibaloy, Kankanae, and the other languages are all spoken by a, so by a certain specific, in a certain specific region and group. And it can be categorized into two main parts. So again, we have the standard dialects and non-standard dialects. It worked like, I cannot speak of the other dialects, but for Ibaloy, we have variations of Ibaloys, but they are still they can still understand each other. So that, according to my understanding, that is like a dialect or a variation of it. And now the last one is where I it gets interesting. Dialects of the same language are often mutually intelligible. So it leaves us a question. Are the language are the are what we consider dialects in the Philippines actually language because they cannot we cannot understand each other if we don't use Filipino to speak to each other it's so hard even for Cordillerans that we have we have different um, speaking systems or dialects language so are we multilingual up to you <laughs> please leave it at a comment if, um, your views on this one now we've got here the benefits of multilingualism um the number one benefit is of course on our brain because it is our brain workout imagine your brain is multifunctioning and that is how the neurons and synapses in our brains are connecting like um, brain brain degeneration or uh, degenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and dementia happens when our brain kind of got lazy and the neurons are not connecting as much as they can or so 
when you when we are speaking multiple languages or even if we are just speaking two languages there's a ton of activities going on in our brains so that makes us that gives a cognitive advantage it also increases our attention span it also increases our problem solving skills and a lot more so yeah and for socioeconomic status of course the more languages you know you'll get better career opportunities you can have your business expanded you can basically have more job you can be eligible for a job promotion as well and for academic benefit of course you can have a chance to study um, study overseas and you can have access to other information which are written in a foreign language that is not yet translated into English or into the known language to you it for recreational of course when you travel it might it's gonna be easier you're gonna meet you can meet new friends basically you can expand your horizon because you can view um, situations or lives in different in a different language which oftentimes language and culture go hand in hand so if you go for example to Greece and you can speak Greek you can have a more immersed experience rather than when you go to Greece as an English speaker your maybe your experience is not as vivid or not as realistic as the ones who, that can speak the uh, Greek next so take a look at the language in our brain so can you imagine if uh, these are the main uh, main language portions or points of our brain so if we s if we are always activating it we are basically giving our brain a full exercise now we've got the types of multilinguals so it can it can be categorized into three we've got compound multilinguals who learn one or more two sets of languages simultaneously for example a baby who is in a multilingual um, environment like would would learn the languages at the same time without thinking like there is if we look at their brains there is kind of like no compartmentalization so they're just learning the concept and the languages that uh, that would stand for it now coordinate multilinguals are language learners who categorize language depending on the context so for example let's say a teenager arrived in the United States at home he speaks Spanish or Filipino or any other la local la um, his mother tongue now when he goes to school he would be using english so in his mind he's a coordinate multilingual because um he would sort of like use in think of english as just for school and so his vocabulary his language function is for academic purposes now when he goes home he doesn't use english anymore he would use his mother tongue to express himself socialize and deal with his personal life now we've got the subordinate multilinguals who learn language by filtering it through their mother language bef um, b before have before getting the full idea of the concept of the language so usually this happens among older language learners so I think we are either in um, we can be core older learners can be coordinate or subord sub subordinate multilingual so for example of a subordinate multilingual um, an older person let's say your grandma would uh, go to America but he, she speaks say she speaks Korean and when she's there she is just translating things like Oh, that's a door and then they would say the door she will she will hear door she she can and then she will look at the picture of a door then the Korean word would pop in her brain and then there will be that is when the association happens that oh there's a door and in English we 
English people call it this way. So usually there is no emotion, there is no attachment to the language. It's just pure translation. And we've got here the things that um, factors that would affect our language learning. So this can either be helpful or confusing depending on the situation. So are they friend or foe? So number one, cognate advantage. Most languages or some languages have some state uh, have some similarities with each other. So for example, Mesa in Spanish is also Mesa in Filipino. Therefore, we always think that, oh, maybe as Filipino speakers, I, it's easier for me to learn Spanish as a third language because we share a lot of uh, similar similarities in vocabulary. So that's the cognate advantage. However, it can be a disadvantage because not all words it might be or it might be used in a different context now leading us to the interlingual homographs or homonyms these are words that mean that sound and and, and are spelled the same in different in different languages which can have the same meaning or another meaning so I cannot help but share a, f um, a video clip that I have watched about Megan Young in Thailand, Cambodia. I'm not. I think it's Cambodia, and she is in a she is in a talk show. So, and the host start, started saying, "Today our the talk show is about buka bukaan, which is op open." To open up in in the in the in their in their language. Now the next word is like buka bukaan, pack pack. So that caught me, and I think Megan was also laughing there because the way they localize fact fact. So what they're actually saying is open fact. So like no secrets. You should open everything about you but for us Filipino learners who associate those words in a different manner it's a very funny situation so that can also happen in interlingual homographs or homonyms so it's uh, a lot the book um, calls it a false friend because you'll never know if you are when you see that word does it mean the same in my language or is it a totally different word now back to our presentation the last one is shared syntactic structure so the grammar the grammatical pattern of a language as it is related to your original language or your mother tongue can also have an impact on how quickly or how more difficult the language is gonna be for you so for example koreans are having problems not in fluency but in like when they speak, their their patterns are quite off because in Korean it's subject, object, uh, subject, object, and verb. So the verb comes at the end, while in English it's subject, SVO pattern. So for Koreans, they would naturally say "I you love," "I you love," but because that's how it that's how the pattern is. In English, we say "I love you." So when you're looking at um, when you're prospecting for a language maybe to learn, you can look at the syntactic structure. If it is related, it's much easier for us to learn it. Now let's have some facts versus myths. So one, multilingualism slows a child's language development. I always get this a lot. So. In the past, it is known as a fact, but for now, it's labeled myth. It's a myth because, again, um, children. Oh, it doesn't really slow your language. Maybe at that time they get confused. However, in the long run, 
they can master in the same span of time they have mastered more than two languages or more than one language in the same span as their peers so no it doesn't slow a child's language development next children are better at learning languages than adults because you can see a lot of younger children speaking the speaking the language very fluently while us adults are like struggling now it is a myth children and adults learn languages as efficiently like when you look when you consider all factors we do learn it the same at the same pace and in most cases adults learn better so why did they say that language learn languages better because children have a higher brain plasticity during the critical period hypothesis <laughs> in the critical period hypothesis time the frontal cortex is still developing and it gives you know the brain brain hemispheres are not um they are not yet totally assigned to the roles so there's a higher brain plasticity for children and again children have more time they are confident to speak they and like us adults who if we try to speak another language we are hesitant we we are a bit shy to do so now if children have the higher brain plasticity as an advantage adults also have an advantage and that is metacognition we can think of how we think and learn and uh, therefore our language learning is more targeted it's not just random words that we hear on tv we actually learn to look at the social cultural cues to be fully functional in the language next only smart people can be multilingual on the surface it might be yes but actually it's a myth because we can always train our brain to learn another one if you are it's a natural reaction of of us like we we when we are in a situation where we need to learn a language it is a primitive survival skill to learn it right like what are you gonna do if people are speaking english and you are not so you have to learn it because you need to communicate though we are individually smart according to the multiple intelligences theory there are other external and internal factors too next code switching is a sign of incompetence in a language so a lot of times when we do taglish or when we are repeating ourselves in translating they would think oh why are you speaking english why don't you just speak in the vernacular if you can't do it but actually code switching is not a sign of incompetence depending on the context because there are contextual and intentional code switching so for example if i know that my again this is a communicative fluency if i know that this word in english would be difficult for my for my audience or for the listener to understand then i would use the vernacular term for it to make the conversation go smoother but if i like for example now on an academic discussion i would try my best not to code switch because i am expected to use english all the way so again it's not a sign of incompetence in a language because it can be intentional depending on the context so if i'm having an english exam or an english interview and i code switched then maybe that's gonna be a minus point for me but generally it's not now speaking a different language affects your personality or behavior who who would say yes who would say no because uh, a lot of people say when I'm speaking Ifugao, I tend to be, I tend to sound more, <clears throat> let's say, uh, brave. 
and strong. I come out strong when I speak Ifugao because that's how that's the inflection and the language. That's the inflection of the language. Also, for a lot of people, um, when you learn a language, you're not just learning the language, you're also learning the language in the context in which it was presented to you. So for example, you're learning, you're learning English and you're watching all those sassy shows, you will be, you will be adapting and speaking the way the actors are speaking in that. So, but definitely no, it doesn't really affect your personality or behavior in the long run. You are still you, it's just how people perceive you. And that leads us to our case study by Ya... Mm, sorry, cannot pronounce it well. Ya Chong Kui. Published by the Cambridge University Press on March 17th, 2022. It's Multilingualism and Identity Construction. A case study of an of a Uyghur female youth. So Uyghur is the, one of the, um, according to my according to my readings, is one of the com in the Philippines they are cons they might be like the Aitas. They are one of the minor minorities uh, or most challenged minorities in China, ethnic minorities in China. So a participant named Maria. It's a female Uyghur chemical engineering student in an undisclosed public university in Nanjing. They decided to not disclose it because there are only a few students, Uyghur students in the university. The methodology is a semi-structured interview along with multiple data sources such as reflective journals and the researcher, researcher also looked at her social media postings and of course behaviors while uh, behavioral observations while they are talking um the study is based on the on two premises that language learning and identity and identity construction research on ethnic multilingual learners so this is interesting because according to the findings of course socioeconomic status and education opportunities go go hand in hand and it's kind of like a like a cycle so competence in a language of a higher status such as um, in this situation is Chinese and English often brings advantages in symbolic terms and opportunities for a successful possible future so that was the result however what actually led Maria to be in this position is though they're a minority um, their socioeconomic background allowed her to learn Chinese. So when she learns Chinese, she she was a um, she was able to be accepted into the government pro program that allows her to go to better um, better schools and you know as it is in China, better high better middle school, better high school, better chances for university admission. So, and while she is learning Chinese and she was like moved outside her village, she is introduced to English, which inspires her because when, she, according to the study, when she's learning English, it seems so cool and elegant and much more elite, which leads to the second finding that an elite multilingual identity is formed. According to the study, Maria went from staying away from her identity as an ethnic minor and want to move abroad or away from her hometown thinking her skills are a waste of time in the community because they speak the ethnic language or the vernacular. They don't really understand Chinese so she can't use it and more English too. However, with a job offer as a student affairs administrator at a university, again, her love and appreciation of her culture is reignited. Moreover, Maria was able to exploit her elite Uyghur identity to serve as a pivotal cultural broker at her workplace. So at least for her, it ended well. However, during the course of the study, it is revealed that there is a s either subconscious effect of learning a language which is perceived to be higher than your language of course languages are all equal but 
if you look at it the a person who is speaking English like for I remembered attending graduations and uh, public speakings when I was younger and they always choose speakers who would speak in English and the parents were like yay that's a smart speaker she he spoke so well but if you but for us children like what did he say I didn't even understand so again um, especially for minorities your ability to speak a higher a language in a perceived to be higher grants you that elite status in the community maybe this is why when we are young we are always um, the number one student is almost always good at English right too <laughs> Now, we've got the conclusion that the conceptualization of identity and transnationalism by including international migration in the broader intellectual conversation by allowing for a richer and deeper understanding of identity construction in relation to how languages are shaped by socioeconomic processes. It is true because for... Let's take, for example, an Aita going to school. He would... Um, to, learn Tagal to learn Tagalog or Filipino, he has to learn things that are not... He has to speak in a different way. And uh, that leaves me to a personal reflection based on this one. That as la we as language providers... As much as we wanted to motivate our students to learn and be interested in other languages, we should also more give more importance on and helping them know their identity. Because take, for example, a student, an Aita, who goes to school and... If we look at how this elite, elitism develops just because of language development, that student is doesn't feel like he belongs in any of either in school or in his community. In school, he might be bullied because he speaks differently. And at home, he is highly regarded because he can speak other languages. He can speak Tagalog. He can, moreover, plus... If he can speak English, he's going to be highly revered. However, he, that student would also be having an identity crisis on what am I now. So as teachers, we should guide, especially if we have students who are coming from different ethnic backgrounds, we should guide them more to know that, yes, we use language to expand our opportunities however we should still hold and be, and be proud of our identity this happens because when you look at let's say Filipinos who go abroad especially if they go to America when they come back they they refuse they would they we all know that they can speak Filipino but they would refuse to use the language maybe subconsciously thinking that speaking English would give them that elite status. So, I'm not sure if my reflection would be the same as yours, but yeah, that's those are the effects and effects of multilingualism on us as a person and that ends my report. Thank you.